about six years ago, I walked on the Marquette University campus because they had selected me to become the director of this new Center for Peacemaking. And as I was walking across the campus toward the building where that Center for Peacemaking was, there was a young student there in front of me, and she seemed quite poised and self-possessed. And I approached her, I said, hello, my name is Simon, and what's yours? And she said, my name is Dwani. And I said, are you from India? She said, yes, I'm from India. She, I said, do you know Gandhi? She said, yes, I love Gandhi. I said, come with me. So we walked in together, this young woman and I, we were the first people to walk into the Center for Peacemaking, and Dwani Rowell became the first of 40 or so students who now are affiliated with the Center for Peacemaking at Marquette University. We, be, we started that community with students, but then more and more faculty started to join us because it's an attractive place when people are usually happy and supportive of one another. And all of us went through a training in nonviolence. It's good to have the will to have peace, but you have to have some skills too. So the first skill that we had to develop was respect. And the, let me play with the etymology for a bit. The word specto means, you know, you look at something. Respect, you look at it again. And the point is sometimes the first impressions, as people say, are lasting, but oftentimes they're mistaken. So you have to look a second time to make sure you see what's really there, because a lot of times we see as we are, not just as things are. And oftentimes respect means we have to look at ourselves as well. You have to look and say, well, how do we understand violence? How do we understand nonviolence? How do we understand peacemaking? And when I see a conflict, how do I take that? How do I receive that? Am I angry? Do I try to charge in? Do I fix things? Do I try to rectify things, make them better? How do I do that? Well, that self-examination also involves some kind of prayer, which we also do, and it's very important. Perhaps you know that Gandhi would pray almost every day. Gandhi would read the Sermon on the Mount every single day of his life. And when we see people like Martin Luther King, who is a man of great prayer, we need to have a higher power than, than we ourselves, or our own prejudices, our own little minds and, and imaginations, to guide us to peace especially because we're, we kind of tend a lot of times toward violence or rejection of others. Well, we form that wonderful community, which we often say at Marquette is the opposite of violence. Community is the opposite of violence. We formed a community there, and the community so would sit around, and so we'd sometimes read nonviolent texts like Martin Luther King or Gandhi, and then we would share ideas and feelings about that. Feelings were very important. Ideas everybody has, but to share feelings means that there's a certain kind of a bond that develops. It's a deeper kind of a bond than just we have a same similar ideas. We're committed to the same things, but we have feelings. And it wouldn't be unusual, for example, for a student who would be having a rough day at home to come in and sit down in the community and say, I need some community support. And then there would be this thing, or this thing happened at home, and then all the community would kind of gather around, and we would talk about it, and then the person would be lifted up, which is what we're after anyway. There's this word, respect, as we said, that means we need to look a second time also at, at others and ourselves. And when we get that second look, we get a vision that is hard to change. Once you, and you start doing that vision over and over again, you start practicing, seeing again and again, and after a while you begin to develop a habit of seeing beyond what's right in front of you. And seeing deeper, maybe you might even say, into a person's soul or into a person's heart especially if that person is vulnerable enough to open up their heart to you, then that's a bond that is hardly broken. Well, it didn't take long before our community of, of, of young scholars, students, to come together and then to be recognized as a very powerful force. In the city of Milwaukee, there was a lot of difficulties. Milwaukee is the 14th poorest city in the United States. It is the most segregated urban area in the United States. It has the highest alcoholism rate of any city in the United States. And as you might imagine, all of those problems devolve upon students in the, in, the, in the schools. Well, we sent our students who had been trained in nonviolence into the schools to train the students in the middle schools and high schools in nonviolence. And our missionaries went out to all of these schools. Everywhere our students went, there was a reduction in suspensions and, sp suspensions and expulsions by something like 50 and 60 percent. And the administrators would come and call us and say, listen, we have a less absenteeism rate now from our teachers. Our teachers like to come to classes now because there's not these conflicts all over. There's not this violence all over the place. There, the students are not fighting the teachers. The students are happy to, to try to learn. And most of the students who were actually trained by our students in nonviolence 
their academic records went up. So it became more and more a, a better place to study and to be, and people were happy to come there. People didn't feel threatened. People felt at home. People felt that sense of community, an academic community, where sh people were shared, sharing their ideas and their feelings and their support for one another. That became a really good thing, and then we heard from Chicago saying, we have trouble in Chicago, can you come over to Chicago and do the same thing in Milwaukee? No problem, we said. So we sent our students over to uh, Chicago. We went into like 12 different schools in Chicago, and the same results happened. A drop in suspension, a drop in susp expulsions, less absenteeism by teachers and, and faculty and administrators, uh, people reporting a better learning atmosphere, everybody who's been in a, in a schoolroom or a classroom knows what that means, a better learning atmosphere. People don't feel conflicted, so they can be open more to ideas and discussing ideas. They can be more and more vulnerable without being shamed. So this kept going on for a number of, of years, and about the second or third year, we were in a school, and a one young woman who was rather tall and quite athletic and was a little bit older than everybody else in the middle school, she was, they were in a classroom and she was caused some disturbance over in the corner. Now she was so big that it was hard to miss what she was doing, but of course as soon as she caused that disturbance, um, the teacher just said, look, you go to the principal's office. Well, this young woman did not want to go to the principal's office and receive this punishment, so she was very reluctant and as she was going down to the principal's office, there was quite a lot of shouting and I don't want to do this and I'm being treated unfairly. And when she got to the principal's office, things were so bad that they, that they had to restrain her from, and she, because of what she was doing in the principal's office. And finally, the principal's office called the police, the Milwaukee police people, and two very burly policemen came in and grabbed hold of this young woman and dragged her out of the school in handcuffs. Well, this is not what we wanted, and this is not what we think is a good school or, at, or atmosphere. It's not a good community situation. But what, has hap what happened to her now, where she is right now, this, that was about six months ago, where she is right now is that this young woman is now the prime proponent of nonviolence in the school in which she is. Not only that, but whenever there's a conflict, they always call on her to resolve the conflict. She has become a mediator now, and everybody respects her. She's strong and big, and she's been through all of this stuff. So what happened? How did she get from being a school dis disobedience and school disturbance and a civil disturbance into being a champion of nonviolence? The answer was she encountered our nonviolent community. And our nonviolent community walked her through this whole situation, meaning what happened to you that day, that morning? Did you get started off on the wrong foot? You did, you, because you disturbed the class. Now, how did you do that? Why did you do that? What were you thinking when you did that? Because attention to the individual is very important. And then, who do you think was affected when, when you did that, when you disturbed the class like that? Well, the other students would say, well, I was affected because I couldn't study. And that's very important because taking what we call I statements are not you statements. You did this. It doesn't stop accusing people, it, and it makes you take responsibility for your own feelings. I felt this. I was disturbed, and I wish that this would have happened instead of something else. So after a long discussion with her, and I was in that circle. They have a circle. It's called a restorative justice circle. There's a restorative justice is, again, the idea is that violence is a disruption of a community. So the idea is to restore the community to where it was before the violence occurred. And everybody, at, like, who knows about, say, broken bones, when a bone is broken and then is healed, at that point where the bone is healed, it's, it's harder than it was before it was broken. And in the same way, a community that is able to transform violence or any kind of incident of violence, becomes stronger and it has a kind of a momentum of peacemaking that allows them to become more robust and a stronger community and be, it allows them to also change all the dynamics of, of violence into something that can be positive. You may be interested to know that Gandhi, uh, when he wanted to, make, wanted to get nonviolent war warriors, he, he wanted people who were capable of fighting. He said, listen, I need people who have courage, who are ready to stand up, who are ready con to confront things. Otherwise, I don't want you. can't be nonviolent. So the point is, once we get people who are pretty fierce and are pretty committed, those are the people we want for nonviolence. Nonviolence is not new to us. I don't know if you remember Henry David Thoreau and Walden Pond. Actually, Gandhi read that, and that's what started Gandhi thinking, wait a minute, I got, maybe this nonviolence stuff might work. And it, of course, it turned out that it did. 
And I'm sure you all remember that wonderful nonviolent act, the Boston Tea Party, which was done in, re in refusal against the tea tax that the British had put on the early colonists. They dressed up like Indians because Indians in those days were the symbol of freedom. So they dressed up like Indians. Look, we want to be free, and so we're going to do this. We're going to resist this kind of tax. We don't want this. So it is a com it's, a, it's in our tradition to be nonviolent. At least you have to go look back sometime. But it's in our tradition to be nonviolent. But it's also important to recognize that evolutionarily it's important for us to be a nonviolent because as a species, look at us, really. I mean, I know we looked, we were all pretty well fit. We were pretty exercised. We eat well, but we don't have armored skin. We don't have claws. You know, we don't have fangs. You know, we don't run very fast. We're a little more than embryos with hair when you think of it. So the idea is that how did we advance as a, as a species, as a human species? We advanced because we could cooperate with each other. We cooperated better. We could communicate with each other. We cooperated better. And then so that we could hunt better and gather better and then build base camps where people could live and, and be protected and share with each other and share food and resources with one another. That's how we advanced as a species and even as a civilization. Other animals didn't do that, and we did, and that's how we got here this way. And so when we have that realization that's going on, we also know that when people take brain tomography scans of an individual in a community, the brain actually works better when you're sitting in a community sharing with people. Your thoughts are smoother, and they, they go much better than when the brain scan shows that you think much better when you're with a community and you think much more clearly, neurons work a lot better. And then when you're in a discus, you're in a dispute, your thoughts really do get jumbled. And Shavas, I think we know that most of us firsthand. When we get into an argument, we don't know the right words to say, or we say five minutes later, well, I should have said this, or I should have, by then it's too late. The point is that when we're in, we're in conflict with one another as human beings, we don't operate well. And then if we go one more step and say, I'm sure you all know about teenage gangs. Nobody has more power over teenagers than other teenagers. When, no matter what the principal says or the teacher says, the other teenagers can just overwhelm that because that's where the influence is. We use that influence in our community to, to push people positively toward peacemaking. For example, somebody might come in and say, you know, this person said this to me the other day, and I just figured, must have had a bad day. Everybody else in the community will go, yeah, probably had a bad day, probably had a bad day. And so now they were reinforced. You don't have to strike back. You don't have to justify yourself. The community now supports you in your peacemaking stance. And you don't have to feel like you're excluded or you're a wimp because the whole community is supporting you. So now that we've, we're out there in the schools in Milwaukee and in Chicago, we're getting calls back saying, this is a great thing that you're doing. And of course, we wouldn't stop there. What we did was we sent people out to South Africa. We sent our people out to South Africa to work in South Africa to do the same kind of community building and nonviolence training that they had had in Marquette out in South Africa. And that worked out really, really well. And we did the same thing in Pakistan. We did the same thing in Afghanistan. Everywhere our students went, the reports were the same. That our students were really aware and alive and they were able to influence people. We sent folks even to Kenya where Folks formed a community of reflection on literature, and the way, was, the way that literature worked was that folks who were struggling with HIV then were able to talk about their feelings and work out ways to deal with the HIV crisis that they were dealing with. But that was also instituted by one of our students, and every one of our students would then come back and say, this is what we did, this is how we did it, and this is how we were accepted. And it was really wonderful to find that our, our students were that powerful and strong. Now, when I think about this, I think about the fact that we think of future utopias. One of the things we have to know right about now, yes, is that the world simply cannot sustain any more war. It's a stupid way to resolve issues. As a human community, we can't do this anymore. It's going to just kill us all. And neither can the ecological world sustain those kinds of things. So if you want to be that kind of person, we do that. We, when, we, when, we can, when we go to Pakistan, when we go to Afghanistan, when we go even, say, to Chicago, we Skype link our students from Milwaukee with the students in Chicago, with the students in, in Pakistan. We Skype link them with the students in Afghanistan. And then the exchange is, what was your hardest case? What was the most difficult 
violence that you had to deal with? And how did you deal with it? Or how did you open up? How did you open up and begin to share your feelings? And usually it's some adult who, who bridges the gap and says, well, the adult who was leading us opened up and so we began to share and we became closer and closer as a community. So now that we're over, we look around, we look at a world, what, how is the world going to become a world where war is not a solution to anything? Which, and how, how is the world going to become where we don't have a war that's going to destroy us and the ecology at the same time? Well, um, when Ignatius, who was one of the distant founders of St. Peter's University and one of the distant founders of Marquette University, all those Jesuit schools you hear about, what well, he used to say when, when you go out and you go out as a missionary, the way our students do, always start, he said, with the young people because they're they're new and they want to try something new and they have, they're not bound by old things. Try, start with the young people. What, how about this? How about thinking about when we want to think about a world that is without war, that is characterized by nonviolence, characterized by respect, by regard for every individual human being and their needs and the honor that is due to them as a human being. How are we going to do that? Come with us. So thank you very much.